Good afternoon. I've been looking forward to present to you some of these very first results from the Copenhagen Pregnancy Loss Project. COBOL is a, an ambitious ongoing research project based at Vido Hospital, uh, which is one of the biggest um, hospitals in the capital region of Denmark. But we also have a list of appreciated collaborators, as you see here in the bottom. My name is Tanya, and I've been the clinical lead of the project for the last two, three years. Um, and then I was also the first author of the paper, um, which I'm going to take you through now. I have no personal con conflicts of interest, but the Kabul project is funded by BioInnovation Institute and the Novus, Nova Nordisk Foundation. <clears throat> and as you know, the definition of pregnancy loss differs from region to region. And in, in Denmark, a pregnancy loss is defined as a spontaneous demise of a pregnancy before 22 weeks of gestation. As you also know, pregnancy loss is occurring very often, and it actually ends approximately one in four pregnancies. We know from previous cytogenetic studies that approximately half of the losses are caused by fetal aneuploidy, but the cause of the remaining part is still unknown. But what we also know from our daily contact with the patients are that they constantly ask, why did this happen? And can we prevent another pregnancy loss? Therefore, my good colleague, Professor Hina Yedis van Nielsen, 10 years ago, started to apply for funding for this ambitious and comprehensive research project looking into sporadic pregnancy loss. In 2020, funding was granted by Bioinnovation Institute and the COBOL project was initiated. Since then, we have invited all patients with a pregnancy loss, not only from our clinic, but also uh, neighboring hospitals and private clinics. All the patients are asked to collect the tissue and uh, when they do, they hand it in to us in a cup like seen here in the right corner. So we can do genetics uh, on the tissue. We are also collecting a lot of other biomaterial and data from not only the women, but also the men and fetuses. We, as I said, started the inclusion in November 2020. And so far we have included 200, two, oh, sorry, 2000 sporadic losses, and we are aiming for another thousand. So we will end up with 3000 losses. And what we do see in the clinic is that it's a very popular and wanted project to participate in. And we can see that approximately 75% of all candidates are accepting can, uh, to participate. And they are ranging from pregnancy losses as early as five weeks of gestation to 22 weeks of, gest of gestation. This is an overview of the different biomaterial we uh, collect. So we are not only collecting the fetal tissue, but also blood from both the men and the uh, women. And we collect urine from both. We collect vaginal swabs uh, to do microbiome testing. We also do rectal swabs. Then we do a comprehensive physical examination. We sent an electronic questionnaire with more than 200 questions. And then we collect semen samples from the men. And with all this, this data, we aim to gain new knowledge on causes for and the impact of pregnancy loss. And with that, we want to improve diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of pregnancy loss. And now the project has been running for some years. And one of the first things we have been focusing on is a feasible and robust method for fetal ploidy determination. That is, in our opinion, highly relevant, as we know that aneuploid losses are associated with a good prognosis, whilst euploid losses have a purer prognosis, as it might be caused by an underlying maternal condition. The genetic status of the fetus is not investigated in the daily clinical practice, as it is today, 
probably because of the inconvenience of collecting tissue and the cytogenetic challenges in analyzing demised tissue. According to current Danish and European guidelines, no investigations are done until plus three losses. Um, we see that focus still remains on emptying the uterus and then try again. In case of recurrent pregnancy loss, array CGH can be performed, but for explanatory reasons. So it is still not a standard to do genetic testing of pregnancy losses. In this paper by Oga Savara uh, from 2000, they show that there is actually a dose response association between number of losses and the risk of euploid losses. But also a decreasing success rate by increasing number of losses. So as you see on the figure to the right, from for each loss, the success rate will decrease. And therefore we find it reasonable to implement a fetal genetic test to for cases of pregnancy loss, uh, if it can be done as a robust and scalable um, manner. Therefore, we have challenged the widely used NIP test or non-invasive prenatal testing that is normally used for living ongoing pregnancies uh, after gestational week 20, 10 to 11. We instead have tested the method on demised pregnancy, pregnancies or uh, pregnancy losses down to five weeks of gestation. Non-invasive prenatal testing in base is based on deep sequencing uh, of circulating cell-free fetal DNA in maternal blood. And it has been a huge success um, for the last 10 years or so. So now it's implemented as a part of the public a healthcare system system in many Western countries, and it's commercially available. Uh, so more than 10 million tests are performed um, or has been performed. We did a self refusal DNA based testing from on on a blood from 1000 couple participants. So we collected maternal blood while the pregnancy product was still in situ. And we used a, a specific type of tubes called strict tubes to protect the, the, the DNA. And then uh, we ran uh, the, the flow similar to the NIPT flow in ongoing pregnancies, but with a few uh, adjustments on the bioinformatics. Also, we did shallow sequencing on tissue, matching tissue from 333 cases. And then we compared the test results of the two methods. I just want to share a few of the clinical findings in relation to ploidy status. So as you see in our cohort, maternal age was significantly higher for aneuploid pregnancy losses and for those cases with multiple aneuploidies, meaning more than one trisomy or monosomy. We also found that paternal age was higher for multiple aneuploidies, and we did not see that BMI was associated with ploidy status. But here you have to bear in mind that the population in Denmark is rather lean. We found that the aneuploid pregnancies had a significantly lower gestational age. So on the next slide, I will present five of the main findings from the study. So here first, I want to show you that we found that even though tissue-based cytogenetics are seen as the golden standard, it is not possible to perform a conclusive result in one third of the cases. And this is despite that all the participants in the couple project actually consented and were motivated. They, ha they had accepted to collect the tissue, but 
uh, in 32 percent of the cases they were either unable to collect any tissue or the tissue they collected was classified as unknown tissue and um, that is meaning that it had a high um, prevalence of uh, of maternal contamination in a subgroup uh, analysis on these tissues classified as unknown tissue, 70% turn out to be maternal. Secondly, self-refused DNA-based testing performed on cases with pregnancy loss in gestational week five to 22 resulted in an 11% inconclusive rate. And most of these were due to low fetal fraction. And as you see, on the right part of the figure, the distribution between aneuploidy and euploidy were approximately 50-50. And that is similar to previous described in cytogenetic studies. And as you also see on the right part of the, of the figure, the panel of detected abnormalities are wide uh, not like in living pregnancies where we mostly find um, trisomy 21 and in rare cases, uh, trisomy 18 or 13. But here we see both a lot of cases with trisomy 16, trisomy 22, monosomy X, but also all uh, the other autosomes. Third, when we compared the results from the, from the blood-based test, so the self-refusal DNA-based test, with the sequencing, direct sequencing of the fetus, we found a sensitivity of 85.1%, and that is telling how many aneuploidies that were correctly uh, annotated. The specificity was 93.3, telling the performance of assigning euploidy uh, correct. Overall, the accuracy was 88.9%. We also calculated the Cohen's coefficient, um, and that was found to be 0.78, and that means a substantial agree agreement between the two tests. As a fourth result, I want to show you the fetal fraction and the um, it's a premise for self fetal DNA-based testing that you have sufficient fetal DNA in maternal blood. So as seen in the figure, the fetal fraction in pregnancy loss cases was actually similar to cases of ongoing pregnancies when we matched by gestational week. Like we know, we know from the non-invasive prenatal testing in ongoing pregnancies, fetal fraction increased by gestational age, and that we also found in our cohort. But from gestational week approximately seven, the no-call rate or the inconclusive rate was stable at around 11%. And last, um, we also looked into the fetal fraction when the blood samples were drawn after the evacuation of the pregnancy product. So after the pregnancy tissue passed from the uterus. And we did that in 89 samples. Uh, and as you see here in the figure, we found that within the first one to six hours, the fetal fraction remained high, but it declined by time. And after 12 to 24 hours, the fetal fraction was too low to uh, give a result or to conclude anything from the test in 35% of the samples. Based on these results, we think uh, that self refuted DNA-based testing is a feasible test for systematic large-scale testing of pregnancy loss. And since we actually gave these uh, results to the patients, it was very clear that it, um, it made a huge impact to get an individual test result for the couples. So it gave them some clarification. We also think that uh, the test has the potential to, um, to uh, make it possible to identify those women uh, losing euploid pregnancy losses 
earlier than with the current uh, counter three um, method. And then we think by adding a ploidy status uh, as a self-refeater DNA-based test, we will be able to focus our future research on earploid losses. And we think that it's here we have to find the unexplained losses. So this is an example of a comment from one of the participating couples. And they said, thank you for carrying out this amazing study. It has been very therapeutic to be a part of it. And it helped me and my partner to work through our pregnancy loss. So, and we have got a lot of these uh, positive um, feedback. And we've also done some uh, some qualitative um, work on what uh, the patients would like or what the patients are, are missing in the current um, handling of pregnancy loss. So these are examples of um, comments from patients suffering from a uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. But also, for sure, the test has some limitations. Um, one of them is being uh, the, uh, the uh, potential to detect atypical genetic aberrations. So that is, for example, triploidies or copy number variations. And they cannot be detected with the current pipeline that we just tested, but we are working on an improved pipeline to enable detection of these abnormalities too. We also are aware that the test has a very short window for blood sampling. As I showed you in one of the resource slides, we see a decrease in the fetal fraction uh, very quickly after the tissue passed from the uterus. So we have to take the blood samples while the, while the product product of conception is still in situ or very shortly after. And in the very early gestational weeks, we had a no-call or inconclusive rate uh, of approximately 50%. So the test is definitely best after week seven, but it is possible also to, to, to do genetic testing earlier. So in conclusion, self-refeated DNA-based testing in pregnancy loss has the potential and feasibility to distinguish fetal euploidy and aneuploidy, which can lead to improved clinical man management and benefit of future research. And if you want to, to read more about the results, uh, I think you should take a look at this paper published in The Lancet in uh, February this year. So you can also use the QR code to uh, to scan um, and and get directed directly to the paper. And of course, I have to thank my whole team. Uh, this would never have been possible without uh, this collaboration of basic researchers, clinical researchers, geneticists, uh, funding uh, organizations, and so on. Thank you.